Welcome, everybody. I'm so delighted that we have such a good crowd tonight. Uh, I'm here in the balmy Florida ATA office where we're having our two days of winter. This morning it was 57 degrees, 13 Celsius, and I went out with two sweatshirts and gloves. But I think we're going to go up here in just a couple of days. So winter, fortunately, doesn't last too long in Florida. I'm sure that there are many people here that are of much sturdier stock than, than I am. I wanted to just tell you about uh, next week. Uh, we have Alan Barash. A is for an alphabet of topical ideas. I have seen the slides for this presentation and it is incredible. Incredible. He's done so much work and will present a plethora of topics, a lot that probably you haven't thought of. So it's really worth it. It's an appropriate topic for stamp collecting month. So do join us and uh, see all the topics that he's come up with. This evening, we have the official ATA Game Master as our speaker. Casey Jo White is a member of our board and she delights us with her fun and her games. She's a creative person, a designer, uh, as I said, a game master who comes up with some great ideas and, and just really puts the fun in philately. So her topic this evening is games on stamps and we can't wait to hear what she's got in store. Casey Jo? Thank you so much for having me. Um, before I get started, I will warn you that here in Indiana, it has been starting to get colder. Uh, the weather has really, it fluctuates a lot here. It's cold and then hot and then cold and then hot. Uh, but it's finally broken down into pretty cold and uh, pretty rainy. And I myself am coming down with a bit of a cold. So I will try my best to um, keep my coughs off mic and uh, I hope you'll bear with me a little bit on that. Um, that said, I am so excited to show you uh, this presentation that I've put together and I hope that you enjoy it. All right, let me go ahead and start screen sharing. All right. Philatelic Fun and Games. So this is the presentation I've put together. It's roughly based on um, a small one frame exhibit I put together. A little bit of background. I uh, spent about 10 years working with a private stamp collector and I did a lot of study on postal history. Um, my background is mostly um, US history. So this um, presentation is going to focus mostly on U.S. Um, stamps and postal history. I know that there's a whole wide world out there of games on stamps, but I've only just scratched the surface of it. So I hope you'll bear with me that I don't have a whole lot from um, worldwide stamps represented in this. Um, it is something I'm working on. Um, so, like I said, one of my, my main interests is postal history. I love the idea of mail and stamps and postage as a way of communicating with each other and getting together. And that's one of the reasons why I was drawn to games as part of postal history, because board games is something that my family does to get together. Um, we sit around the table, we play board games together. Um, it's a great way to break the ice at family gatherings. Um, you know, we've always had a game at a table. Um, and we've built up a great collection of games, and I noticed some like postal themes in some games. So this presentation is not just about games on stamps, it's about stamps on games as well. We're going to look at kind of the relationship and how stamp collecting and games bring people together. Um, so it's going to be a little bit different. Um, I hope that you enjoy it. So let's start off with correspondence games and playing by mail. 
Uh, what I have here is an advertising cover. Um, it is advertising the Wells Memorial Checker Club. Um, checkers has been around for thousands of years. Um, early checkerboards date back as far as 3000 BC. Board games are traditionally played in person. Um, so playing with a friend or family member is fun, but if you want to play more often or if you want to play competitively, you might join a gaming group. Um, so this cover shows this checking checkers club. Um, I know my husband is a member of a board game association called the Train Gamers Association. They play all board games that have trains as a theme. So he is a thematic collector in board games. Um, so you can see this uh, advertising cover. This advertising cover it was sent through the mail and it gives us a look into the history of these gaming groups. It is a piece of history, um, a physical piece that we can find that gives us evidence of this. I got this cover because it had checkers on it. Um, and then I looked it up and um, I found this news article about the Checker Club and about the games and the people who played those games. And that is one of the ways that uh, mail and games both bring people together and connect us all. So if you can't get together in person, but you are still interested in playing board games, uh, you can play some games through the postal system. And one of the oldest play by mail games is Correspondence Chess. Um, although it's believed that royalty played games of chess through mail as far back as the ninth century, the first recorded and authenticated games of Correspondence Chess were played in the Netherlands in 1804. Um, modern Correspondence Chess players can purchase postcards that are specifically made um, to illustrate and record moves. So this is an example of one of those cards. Um, this card um, I purchased um, from an eBay lot. Uh, the woman uh, was cleaning out a relative's um, storage and she told me the story behind this. Um, her relative prepared these beforehand, which explains why it's already stamped, but it hasn't been sent through the mail. Um, so she sent me some used copies and also some of these copies that were ready to be used. Um, and what they would do is they would they have little um, hand stamps. Uh, they'd put their, they'd stamp the different uh, positions of the different chess pieces and then you had the back where you would write down um, where what move you were making that turn and then you'd send that off and you'd each record each other's chess game and uh, send them back and forth um, so you could see that the there has also an advertisement for the company that you could purchase these cards from um, play by mail games like Correspondence Chess allow people to play games with friends or members of gaming groups all around the globe. Uh, this example is a representative of a player in the US and a player in Austria. So you can see that it well, came from Austria and it went by airmail and it ended up in California. And you could see they have logged their, their moves and everything. Um, I think that's really cool. It turns out that most of the covers that I find for Correspondence Chess are uh, worldwide covers. Um, so this is an example of me stepping out of my comfort zone and studying more worldwide because I have this opportunity with these Correspondence Chess covers I'm able to find. Um, the International Ch Correspondence Chess Federation was founded in 1928. Here is a gem of a cover that I I was so lucky to be able to find. Um, so this cover is actually mailed from Milton Bradley, which is one of the oldest um, board game companies in the US. Uh, you can see the advertising uh, uh, corner card there for Milton Bradley. Um, this was, it advertises, um, 
the company. Uh, the company was founded in 1860, and it was family owned until 1984 when it was purchased by Hasbro. Um, and then Hasbro later also purchased um, Parker Brothers, which was the other major board game uh, producer in the United States. Um, so both of those brands are under Hasbro, or they were under Hasbro. I think it's all merged together into Hasbro Gaming now. Um, so this cover mailed the solution to a puzzle game called the Tower of Hanoi. This is one of the more popular puzzles. You've probably seen some version of it. Um, basically, it is three or some other number, traditionally three, sticks and then um, a set of discs that slide onto those sticks. You need to move all of the discs from one stick to the other, but you cannot put a smaller disc on top. Um, you cannot put a larger disc on top of a smaller disc. So you need to strategize where you are going to move each of the discs in order to make that move from one place to another. Um, it is a puzzle that can be fairly elaborate based on how many sticks and how many discs you want to put on those. Um, and so Milton Bradley produced their own version of this. This is the, or er, yeah, this is the only example of this. It's the box. I found it on an auction site, um, but the auction has been gone for a long time. Um, but that is an example of what the box would look like, um, the Milton Bradley version of this. So you can see the, the sticks and the colorful discs um, making that tower. Um, this was sent third class mail. Something interesting um, from a postal history standpoint is that third class mail in the U.S. was for um, mail that did not have any writing or personalized correspondence on it. So this printed letter, um, because it was printed out and it didn't have any like handwritten note or personal correspondence, companies could send these circulars out at a cheaper cost. Um, the downside of that is that the postal system didn't always um, specifically, you know, the, they were a little more lax. And if your letter got there a little late, um, you know, that was just the price you paid by paying a lower price. Um, so to kind of not advertise how slow these were going, if you see a letter from like the early 1900s or the late 1800s and it doesn't have a date stamp um so like this postmark just says springfield massachusetts um the there's a reason for that it's because by not putting a date on it you can tell you can't tell how slow the post office was going um that's kind of a telltale tell sign that it's third class mail aside from obviously the cheaper price um so Let's talk about some board games. We talked about Milton Bradley as a company. In the U.S., there is only one board game on any U.S. stamp. Um, the, this is the only one. It is the uh, Celebrate the Century stamp for Monopoly. Um, I Trust me, I've, I've looked at so many U.S. stamps, I cannot find any other board game um there are sports stamps obviously um that is not something that i'm uh currently collecting um the backyard game stamps that were issued recently are probably the closest thing to what i would consider like games um for my collecting purposes uh but since i'm limiting this to tabletop currently um someday i might get into more of those uh more physical games or or video games, um, but for right now, tabletop games. Um, so this is the only one on a U.S. postage stamp. Uh, it was selected for as a subject for the 1930s. Um, the predecessor to Monopoly was the Landlord's Game. It was designed by Elizabeth Maggie and patented in 1904. Um, Maggie was a teacher and she used this game um, as an educational experience for her students to teach them about different um, economic ideologies, specifically uh, the Georgist uh, ideology. Um, so the game 
as it kind of spread, her students went and told it to other people that they liked this game um, and continued. People started making their own house rules and it became Monopoly. Uh, Charles Darrow was the one who learned it from his friends and began producing his own version under the name Monopoly. Um, and so he copyrighted his version in 1933. Um, Parker Brothers bought the rights uh, uh, for the game from Darrow in 1935. Um, so he made the money off of it. Um, Maggie really didn't, which makes sense because Maggie's version was a less capitalist version. And um, Darrow's version was the more, you know, monopolistic, capitalist, uh, more competitive version. Um, since Maggie's version was more about um, teaching and education, it was a little uh, softer and um, less cutthroat. So in 1991, Hasbro bought out Parker Brothers. I mentioned that before. Um, and then they acquired the Monopoly brand, which they still own today. Monopoly is one of the most popular board games, although I personally am not a huge fan of it. I think it takes too long. And I do think that that uh, competitive aspect can kind of draw it out a little bit. But it is incredibly popular. And so that brings me to the Opoly games. Now, if we want to talk about stamps on games, the Opoly games are where it is at. So these, in the same way that Daro took his idea for the Monopoly from Maggie, um, late for the Sky Production Company, um, they were founded in the 1980s and they made custom Opoly games for themselves and for their clients. So this company still exists. If you want to make your own Opoly game, you can uh, go to their website and they will work with you to produce a um, kind of an off-brand Monopoly. Um, basically, it's the the exact same rules and everything, but they they put their own um, designs and everything on it. Um, if you were somebody who visited a mall at some point in the um, late 2000s, early 2010s, around Christmas time, you probably saw a little kiosk in the mall full of everything. Dogopoly, Catopoly, um, Sportsopoly, Dinosauropoly. Um, those were pretty much all made by this company. Now, the USPS around 2008 partnered with them to make three different post office Opoly games. Um, so these are officially licensed by the USPS, although they are not officially licensed by Monopoly. <laughs> um, and that's why they were able to use these uh, real USPS stamp images. So you'll see there's three of them. There's Wonders of America that is all about the Wonders of America issue of stamps. Uh, one for holiday stamps and one for love stamps. Now, the USPS does have an official monopoly. Uh, just recently, I think within the last year, they have issued a official monopoly US stamps edition. Um, you can purchase this right now on like it's um, the USPS website where you would go to like order first day covers or um, stamps. They have a section for gifts and this board game is currently for sale there. Um, they partnered with Hasbro to release this official version in 2022. Personally, I kind of like the off-brand Monopoly's pieces better. Um, the Late for the Sky version of uh, Post Office Opoly uh, has a little piece that is Oni the male dog and a little piece that's Mr. Zip. I kind of think those are a little bit cuter than the official designs, uh, which you could see here um, for the movement pieces, which are like an, the Sonic Eagle, a roll of stamps, and um, a letter. So, you know, it's your taste, whichever one you would prefer. But like I said, I am not a huge fan of... Um, Monopoly, personally, uh, which is why I, if I had to recommend a stamp board game, I would recommend The Great American Mail Race. This is another officially licensed by the USPS board game. Um, it is called The Great American Mail Race, and it is uh, published by a independent game company called Big Potato Games. Um, 
it was published in 2022 and I own this game. It is a lot of fun. It's fast paced. It doesn't take as long as Monopoly. And uh, the goal of the game is you have a map. You need to deliver the most mail using a variety of real delivery methods that evolve throughout the game. So like at the start of the game, your cards will be like Pony Express or, um, you know, mail ship or uh, just regular trail. Um, and so that will be moved to spaces. Uh, that's the Pony Express card. Um, you'll evolve as the game goes. The cards that you draw will be things like hot air balloons um, and then later a van, which lets you move faster. Um, and you can steal packages from other people. And when you um, deliver a package, it actually comes with a little hand stamp. You, you stamp your card to your uh, scorecard to show how many deliveries you, you've made. I really enjoyed this game. I recommend it. And again, you can purchase this game on the USPS website. Um, it is in their gifts section. Um, so if you're looking for a holiday gift, um, it's a fun one. So let's talk about a couple other board games. So this is an example of delivering games, uh, kind of like our correspondence chess. Um, but this is an expansion for a game called Saboteur. I really like Saboteur. I like so many games. Um, and when we visited Gen Con, it's a gaming convention in 2017, um, attendees could stop by the Mayfair booth. Um, Mayfair is the company that published this game. And they could, and they were given um, this postcard. Uh, we picked up two. We picked up one for ourselves and one to mail to a friend. Um, and basically, you mail this postcard out. We mailed ours to a friend in Kentucky, um, and we kept one. And they can then use this postcard in their game. It serves as an expansion. Um, Saboteur is a card game where you build a map using cards. And in this expansion, you would place the postcard in the middle, and then all of your cards have to match up to get into that spot. And then you can uh, make some changes to the games. Um, I thought this was a really neat idea. I'm not aware of any other board game offering postcard expansions. Uh, if you know of one, please let me know, because I would love to get more. Let's talk about cards. So card playing cards are a super interesting um, thing for stamp collecting because it is a philatelic legacy. We are going to see the evolution of um, a revenue stamp into um, a Cinderella or a piece of ephemera. So oh, revenue stamps were used to pay taxes on documents. Um, or luxury goods, including playing cards. So from 1894 until 1965, the U.S. issued specific stamps to pay the tax on playing cards. And these um, stamps featured like the classic card iconography, like hearts and diamonds and clubs and spades. And they had no relationship to the post office. You couldn't mail a letter with a playing card stamp, but um, they had a super long lasting impact uh, because companies would use the tax stamps to seal the lids of card packages. Um, by the time that, like the idea for the, for the tax stamp was if you put the stamp over the package, when you opened the package, you tore that stamp. And that served as like the cancellation. You couldn't reuse that tax stamp because you've torn, torn it apart. Um, so companies were using these tax stamps to seal the lids of their card packs. Um, by the time the tax was abolished, gamers were so accustomed to that act of breaking a seal on a new pack of stamps um, that these stamp companies or these playing card companies didn't want to get rid of the stamp. Um, so they started producing their own little sticker seals um, that you can see. Um, you can find catalogs of ephemera collectors who have put together logs of the different kinds of um, 
playing card seals over the gears. Um, so like here is a modern post uh, playing card deck that I have not yet opened and you can see that it is still sealed with that sticker. And speaking of that, did you know that the USPS issued its own deck of cards? Um, in 2018, the USPS issued a deck of cards themed around the Art of Magic stamps. Um, in a philatelic tradition, the packs were sealed with a stamp, a stamp-like sticker with a new palm reading design. Um, so the only place you could get this seal, um, this stamp-shaped seal, uh, is on this pack of cards. Um, it is a unique design. Um, it's not a design on any of the actual postage stamps. It was made just for these cards. Um, but the Art of Magic uh, playing card deck is pub it was manufactured by the United States Playing Card Company. Um, it uses the images of the stamps for the face cards, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, the United States Playing Card Company uh, was founded as its own company in 1885, and they produced many of some of the famous card brands, including B, Bicycle, and Congress. Um, so on the previous page, you saw that uh, we had the United States Playing Card Company uh, tax stamp, the United States Playing Card Company seal, and now here we have the United States Playing Card Company stamps. So cards are some of the oldest um, gaming pieces that are known. They were used in Europe during the late eight, late 1300s, but were probably used even earlier in Asia. Um, they are so old, we don't have clear records on how old they are. Uh, so what I'm showing here is called a, um, I believe it's called a commemorative uh, cancellation, like a souvenir sheet not a souvenir sheet, um, commemorative sheet. These are issued by the USPS. Um, they're kind of a little known thing that I, I wish more collectors knew about. Um, they're officially produced by the USPS and it's basically a sheet of paper. It includes the stamp, it includes a first day cancel, and it includes a ton of information about the design of the stamp and you know even how many of the stamps were issued. If you're a collector and you don't know about these, you should try to look them up because um, they would make a great addition to an exhibit or a collection. Um, and they're just something that that a lot, I feel like a lot of people don't know about. So that's why I wanted to include it in here. Um, in 2009, the USPS issued a pair of stamps featuring a king and queen of hearts um, from the classic, what we think of the classic playing card deck. Um, so if Monopoly is the only board game on a stamp, we do have playing cards on a US stamp. Uh, here's an enlarged version of the designs. Um, these stamps were based on early French playing card decks. Um, they were, the French decks were the first to use uh, the common suits that we know today. Um, so, you know, the spades and, and diamonds and hearts. Uh, since these were issued as part of the Love series, uh, the stamps focus more on the heart than the card, the like playing card aspect itself, um, because they're for love. Collectible card games. So you can't talk about cards and collecting, um, stamp collecting without talking about collectible card games. So collectible card games, CCGs, are also sometimes called trading card games or TCGs. And it's a type of game that involves building a deck of individual cards from your collection to play a strategic game. And these games were popularized by Magic the Gathering, which was first published in 1993. Um, you'll see up here in the slide, I have this Village Messenger card. Um, it is from a werewolf expansion uh, or series of the Magic the Gathering. Uh, card game. Um, so for that, you would purchase your, your cards, you'd buy them in packs or in, in boxes, or you would trade with other players to build your collection, and your collection is how you would play the game. Um, so this is a way to combine gaming and collecting. Um, there isn't a philately or philatelic themed collectible card game yet. 
Um, but there are some postal elements in these games, which is why I've included them. As you can see, we have the village messenger and we have some Pokemon cards um, that have letters and a mailbox. And I really wanted to show the Pokemon cards because something that I found interesting was um, there are these Pokemon cards from the early 2000s or Pokemon stamps from the early 2000s. A lot of them were issued by um, some of these islands and territories that produced a lot of stamps uh, less for mail use and more for collecting use. Um, they were capitalizing on the fact that Pokemon was really popular at that time. Um, but I wanted to show you a comparison between this stamp and its little souvenir sheet, which is about the size of a play of a Pokemon card. Um, and an actual Pokemon card from around the same time. And you'll notice that at the bottom, it has like a little phrase, a little description of the character. Um, it's like their Pokedex entry. It says, adores circular objects, wanders the street on a nightly basis to look for dropped loose change. And then if you look over at the stamp, it has that exact same text. Adores circular objects, wanders the streets on a nightly basis to look for drop to change. Again, that's just a, a text that would have been um, in like the official Nintendo um, materials, but I just think it's interesting how card-like this stamp is. And then of course I have to show you my posted card. Um, so this is a playing card that was sent through the mail as a postcard. Um, some collectors um, like to have fun with a and with appropriate postmarks. Um, so this Seven of Spades playing card was sent through the mail uh, from Seven Stars, Pennsylvania. Um, so they've got this uh, postmark from a town that kind of matches, um, you know, the Seven Stars, Seven of Spades. Um, it's a one and a half cent stamp. It pays the third class rate for a small printed item. Like I said, that third class rate for non-personalized mail um it's people had fun with that right so let's talk about some puzzles this is another piece from my collection that i was really excited to find this is somebody sending a puzzle through the mail specifically um it is a christmas card which is extra exciting for me because my other collecting interest is holiday cards so this novelty Christmas card was mailed third class from Cleveland to Wapakonota, Ohio. And it is a cloth mailing bag um, attached to a postcard as an attachment. Um, so it is a Christmas card and a puzzle all in one. Um, there's no date on the package, probably because it was sent third class um, because people could buy these um, pre-manufactured, pre-printed uh, uh, little kits of these puzzles. Um, they could be sold, they could be mailed at that third class rate. Um, it was likely made and sent sometime in the mid 1940s, early 1950s. Um, the mailing bag satisfies a solo use of that three cent Prexy stamp. I know that Prexy collectors love to find those uh, genuine uh, single uses, so it's it's fun in that reason too. Um, this is what the puzzle that is included in the bag looks like when it's all put together. Um, it is, you know, pre-printed the fries, so it has their family um, with a little personalized with their names, and then some of the shapes you'll see of these puzzle pieces are a star and a bell and a tree. Um, so little Christmas themed pieces. Talking more about puzzles, jigsaw puzzles date back to like the mid 1700s. They come in many different styles and difficulty levels. Um, originally, most of them were made out of wood, but cardboard puzzles like this one, and like a lot of the modern ones today were introduced around the 1930s. Um, because they were so quick and easy and cheaper to produce. And that really kicked off the boom in um, uh, jigsaw puzzles. You'll notice that this piece 
and this puzzle does not have interlocking pieces. Uh, what that means is I could take my hand and slide it across this and all those pieces would move. The pieces fit together, but they don't lock together. Um, interlocking puzzle pieces were popularized in the early 20th century, so they would have been around before this card was issued, but uh, that's when they were most popularized. Um, the Greenleaf Steel, Steel Rule Die Corporation, um, they produced a series of mailable puzzles based on postage stamps. Uh, these puzzles featured images of stamps from the 1970s to the 1990s and were collectively known as the Commemorative Puzzle Series. Um, the puzzles were totally intended to be sent through the mail. Um, so a plastic covering on the front kept the puzzle pieces sealed in place while it would travel through the mail, and the back was designed just like a postcard, so it had space for an address and a message. Um, but these could not be sent at the postcard rate because they were too heavy, they were a bit too bulky to qualify for that lower postcard rate, so you'll see that there is a note there that it requires first class postage. So this is an example of the stamp that it provides the image for the design, uh, the back of it, and the front with a piece missing. Um, I have a couple different versions, different stamps, um, post puzzle postcards. Um, I anytime I see them, I try to grab them up. Uh, I've got ones that are, uh, you know, holiday stamps. Um, I've got some of these lighthouses. I've got a bunch of different ones, um, but I don't have them right here with me at this very moment. Um, so putting the pieces together, one of the things I, talking about the um, similarities between games and um, stamps and how that brings us together, if you went to the Great American Stamp Show like I did, they had a big table out in the front and it was for stamps by the bucket. and Anytime you went there, it was full. There was just people around the table and they were just digging through stamps and someone would say, I'm looking for a cat. And so you would dig through and, and someone would be like, oh, here's here's some cats and they would pass them around. Everybody is helping each other find what they need. And it reminds me a lot of people working on a puzzle together, just digging through a big bunch of puzzle pieces to put the pieces together. Um, and I just think that's fun. Uh, I like the idea of your collection being a puzzle that you're putting together for yourself. Um, final thoughts. I have a couple things that I did not get scanned to put into the presentation that I'm going to show you now. Over, um, let me stop the screen sharing so I can show you larger, hopefully. Um, this. I, I purchased this. It is a stamp puzzle. It is a little wooden puzzle um, that is stamp sized. It is a US stamp from the Civil War series. And yeah, you can actually take these pieces apart and put it together as a puzzle. It is a little wooden puzzle. Um, I can't get it apart right now because it is interlocking pieces, but you can see there that it's little pieces. Um, so that is a fairly recent addition for me. Um, I only got it like last year. Um, as an example of stamp puzzles, another example I have of stamp puzzles is this Wentworth wooden puzzle that is the um, penny black. Um, again, another interesting puzzle because it has shaped pieces. So in addition to the interlocking puzzle pieces, some of the pieces in this puzzle are specifically cut to shapes that relate to the puzzle. So for example, this puzzle piece is for portrait. And you would, actually I have the place where it goes. So this puzzle piece, and you put that right in there, and that would go somewhere in the actual puzzle. And then, of course, you know, you can uh, 
find puzzles that have postal themes to them. Um, this is something I was given as a gift last year. It is a holiday stamps puzzle. Um, one thing I find particularly interesting about this one is that um, these are, you know, it says holiday stamps, but it's actually just illustrations. None of the stamps that are featured in this puzzle are real um, U.S. stamps, or as far as I can tell, none of them are real stamps from any country. They're just Christmas images with like that that stamp perforated border um, that they've put together. Uh, it's still really pretty and I still really like it. Um, it's just interesting that that's the case. Um, so those are some examples of things that I didn't quite get into the PowerPoint, but I wanted to show off as well. Um, we've still got about 15 minutes and I'm happy to answer questions um, and see if I need to talk more on any specific uh, piece for now. <laughs>